So the question we're trying to answer with this model that we're going to build is why the Industrial Revolution happened uh, in the 18th century and why did it happen in England, right? Why didn't it happen in China in the 15th century or in India in the 10th century? Why didn't it happen in you know, Africa in the 7th century? Why didn't it happen in any of these places except for uh, England in the 18th century? Um, and so we're going to look at uh, a bunch of different possible explanations, but we're going to build our model based on this first one here, which is the relatively high cost of labor and cheap local sources of energy, namely coal. Um, but it's not the only explanation. It's not the only possible explanation, right? So the scientific revolution and the enlightenment certainly played a part. Um, the political and cultural characteristics of nations, which we're going to call institutions, uh, are definitely very important. Um, cultural attributes such as working hard and savings are important. So if we think about uh, growth in East Asia recently, savings have played a big role because that's fueled the investment in physical capital that has allowed those countries to uh, grow very quickly. Um, and then abundance of coal and access to colonies uh, is, is also related. Of course, the European uh, countries had started putting colonies in the Americas uh, in the uh, 16th century, um, and that provided them with a fair amount of uh, natural resources um, and provided some of them with uh, gold and silver as well. So the way we're going to model this technology is we're going to think about uh, uh, an input, uh, two inputs, workers and coal, and how those are combined into an output. And so in this case, we're going to think about our output as 100 meters of cloth. And it's interesting to think that the Industrial Revolution really started in textiles and making cloth um, because it was one of the more time intensive processes uh, that people worked on at the time um, and took a, a lot of hours in order just to produce cloth. And so we're going to think about these five different uh, technologies. We're just going to label them A, B, C, D, and E and how many workers they need and how much coal they need. Now, coal is really sort of standing in as sort of energy and capital in this model, right? It's not you can't just take a lump of coal and say, okay, make some cloth. You can't even give a lump of coal to a person and say, okay, make some cloth, right? You need to uh, use that coal uh, in order to produce energy, to, in order to use technology um, to create the cloth. And so, you know, uh, technology E uses mostly workers, right? 10 workers and just one ton of coal to produce 100 meters of cloth, whereas technology A uses one worker and six tons of coal to produce 100 meters of cloth. So we say that uh, technology E is relatively labor intensive, it uses a lot of workers, and technology A is relatively energy intensive or sometimes we say capital intensive. So let's look at these different technologies and what we're going to do is we're going to graph them on a graph where we put the number of workers on the horizontal axis and the number of tons of coal on the vertical axis. And so here's A, which uses more coal and fewer workers. Here's B, which uses fewer workers, uh, excuse me, more workers than A and fewer uh, tons of coal. C uses seven tons of coal and three workers. D uses five tons of coal and five workers. And then E, is the most labor intensive, uses 10 workers and one ton of coal. And remember, we're getting the same output for all of these combinations, right? We're getting 100 meters of cloth for all of them. So some of these choices are clearly worse, right? Because you need more of at least one input and the same or more of the other input. And so we can say those technologies are dominated by other technologies, right? They're clearly worse than the other ones. And the way that we can see that is just by drawing out these vertical and horizontal lines from uh, each point and seeing if any other points are covered, right? So in this case, C is dominated by A because C needs more tons of coal, seven instead of six, and more workers, uh, three instead of one. D is dominated by B, right? We need more coal, five instead of two, and more workers, five instead of four. And so it's going to be more expensive. On the other hand, there are no uh, technologies dominated by E. And so the remaining technologies that we're going to want to look at are A, B, and E. 
So if we think about a firm's choice, they're going to want to maximize their profit. And profit is just revenue minus cost. And so if we're thinking about uh, 100 meters of cloth, then maximizing their profit is the same as minimizing their cost, right? We, they want to produce those 100 meters of cloth at the least possible cost. And so that's going, their costs are going to depend on how many workers they use and what the wage is and how much coal they use and what the price of coal is. And so that's just wage times workers plus price of ton of coal times the number of tons of coal. So W times L plus P times R. So what we're going to do then is we're going to create what's called an ISO cost line. And so we're going to use this term ISO uh, a number of times this semester. ISO just means the same. So ISO cost lines means the lines that represent the same cost. All of the combinations of inputs that give the same cost, right? And the slope of that line is going to be the relative price of inputs. And so we can derive it from the cost equation by you know, rearranging this and putting R on the left-hand side. We're not going to really have to worry too much about that math. We're mostly going to just work in pictures here. And then the firm will choose the least cost technology. Now, note that what's important is going to be the price of coal and the wage, right? Those are going to be the two most important determinants of what the least cost technology is. So let's build our ISO cost lines here. And so if we say that the wage is 10 pounds and the cost of coal is 20 pounds, then we know that at point P1, we have two workers and we have three tons of coal. Two times 10 is 20. Three times 20 is 60. 20 plus 60 is 80. Then at P2, we can say, all right, well, one ton of coal times 20 is 20. Six workers times 10 pounds is 60. 20 plus 60 is also 80. So those two points must be on the same ISO cost line, right? And so that ISO cost line is 80 pounds. All of the points along that line are going to cost 80 pounds to produce. We don't know that they're all feasible, right? That's not what we're saying. We're just saying that all of the points along that line will cost 80 pounds. Now, if we shift up, then any uh, line outside of that is going to cost more. And so this line here at Q1 and Q2, where we use three workers and six tons of coal, or five workers and five tons of coal, are on the 150 pound ISO cost line. And so you can clearly see that you know we're using more uh, workers and more coal at those points, and it's going to be more expensive. So as we move out from the origin, uh, we get more expensive on the ISO cost lines. So here's two more lines. So here we have a 40 pound ISO cost line. Here we have a 120 pound ISO cost line. The slope of the ISO cost line is always going to be the same here as long as the prices don't change. And the slope is just minus the wage divided by the price. So in this case, the wage is 10. The price of coal is 20. Minus 10 divided by 20 is minus 1 half. And so you can see all of these lines are parallel, meaning they all have the same slope. And that's because the wage and the price of coal are constant in this picture. So as we said before, you know, if you have one uh, line and that's you know, your lowest cost line, 80 pounds, then anything above that is going to cost more. Anything below that is going to cost less. But you might not have the option of, of spending less in this case.